Welcome back to another episode of Domains 21. Um, I have the distinct pleasure in this uh, segment to be talking with both Kathleen Fitzpatrick and Scott Chopri, who are both part of the MESH, the MESH Research Center, and we'll find out more what that means shortly. Um, but Kathleen is the Director of Digital Humanities and a Faculty of English at Michigan State University, and Scott is the Assistant Dean for Academic and Research Technology. So without further ado, I'd like to invite them both to the stream and say hello. Hi, Scott. Hi, Kathleen. Hi. 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 So I wanted to start this chat um, talking a bit about MESH. A, what does MESH stand for? What does it do? And tell me a little bit about your groovy mission statement, if you will. <laughs> will do. Um, so MESH is not an acronym. Um, it is meant to be a parallel in the MSU universe to Matrix, um, which has been a digital humanities center here at MSU for a very long time. Um, so MESH is, is a research and development unit at MSU that's focused on the future of digital scholarly communication. And our, our value statement that we have on our website at meshresearch.net really focuses on the principles of openness, of interoperability, of transparency um, in governance, and of um, really thinking about the ways that the platforms that we use for, for scholarly communication today might best be academy-owned and governed, um, might best operate as, as part of the scholarly networks of, of communication that we are relying on today. So that's, you know, MESH has, has been around for about a year and a half now. Um, I'm the director of the unit. Scott is one of our associate directors. Um, and we're working on a whole series of projects at MESH, um, including supporting the future of humanities commons, um, including thinking about um, new models um, and technologies for open peer review, um, and a whole range of other things besides. So there's a lot, a lot coming out of MESH that I think is um, potentially exciting. I was particularly taken by the, the discussion of MESH privileges, open source, academy owned, collaboratively developed, transparently governed, I wrote it all down, yeah. and highly interoperable systems. And it's as if the mission statement is as much about equity as it is about thinking about the technologies and the infrastructure that maybe can afford or provide some of that equity at the level of the campus and the academic institution. Does that make sense? And can you guys talk a little bit more about what that, that looks like and how you're doing it? Yeah, I think it does make sense. And I think it's a really core component of not just the, the projects that we're working on, but also the ways that we're trying to work on them. Part of what we're doing is setting in the infrastructure for our work and the work with the faculty in our college and around MSU and beyond um, that allows for us to, you know, do all of those, all of those values that Jim just um, uh, spit out back at us there that, that we we're talking about, but setting up those infrastructures to allow that to happen and to then work with them to kind of um, get people into the, those structures and working in that way. So it's both a, a technical, but also kind of a really uh, social and contextual piece um, and community piece that we're working on developing. Absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, you know, that that bit about transparently governed and academy owned is is really key. Um, what we're looking at is a lot of the systems that are being used on college campuses, college and university campuses right now that are um, basically scraping enormous quantities of university produced data in order to sell that data back to the campus. Um, so what we're trying to do is find ways to create the platforms and the infrastructures that will allow campuses to be more self-determining, um, to maintain ownership over their own data, to have some rights in the ways that the platforms that they're reliant upon develop into the future, um, to have a, a kind of autonomy um, and, and self-reliance in that regard, I think is really crucial for the future of the academy. And so developing those platforms to support that kind of work is a core part of the MESH mission. 
you know, in a lot of ways, we focus on open, o open and openly available platforms. Um, so open source projects and that, but we don't necessarily exclusively focus in that area because um, there are a number of uh, things that we bring onto our campus that are, you know, more corporate or for profit products, but with uh, institutions and companies that are working to make those data more open and make the systems more open and interactive. Um, so some of our, you know, faculty reporting systems in order to work with annual review and that are, are systems that are allowing us to be a little more open with trading data into and out of those systems and really owning the data that faculty are putting into those systems. Yeah, I, I think it's important to note that there are better and worse players um, among corporate partners in these kinds of projects. Um, so we we do privilege open source um, platforms and products in the work that we're doing. Um, but where there are good actors um, who are willing to share data with us, we are more than happy to, to connect with them. Another thing that I was really compelled about by the, the mesh statement. And I really, I spent a lot of time just goggling at the mesh site is the way in which you talk about providing kind of like cutting edge, you know, digital scholarship tools. And, you know, you deal with a wide variety of them from no one provider. Can you all talk a little bit about some of those projects and, you know, how you're doing that, what they provide for your community and, you know, how the mesh research center, which is linked with the library, which I find a lot of these, mm -hmm things are, um, kind of, you know, lifts up everybody at the campus, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can start by talking a little bit about um, Humanities Commons, which is the largest of the projects that MeSH is working on right now. Um, Humanities Commons was originally established by the Modern Language Association, and it was meant to be a platform on which scholars um, regardless of employment status or physical location or credentials or anything else, could start an account and create a public profile and communicate with other folks in their field um, that they wanted to be in communication with. And it was intended as well, Humanities Commons writ large, to be a platform that would support scholarly, like small scholarly societies that need to foster communication and collaboration amongst their members, but um, weren't able to support their own platforms um, in order to do so. So this was going to be a, you know, a collaborative space in which those societies and the individual scholars would come together and collectively um, develop a, a platform for, for social and intellectual communication. And it's worked to some extent, right? We've got 26,000 users across the humanities and around the world who've created profiles and are in there doing this work. But we're at a point at which it became clear that to make this platform sustainable, we needed to bring it to campuses. We needed to really think with campuses about how the commons as a platform could support their needs and could work with them um, to, to really get those campuses invested, again, in that academy-owned, transparently governed system for thinking about scholarly communication. Um, so we've brought Humanities Commons to MSU. It's now resident here um, and hosted here. And we have um, started the first institutional node on the network, MSU Commons, which is um, in beta, but is about to open up to the entirety of the campus um, and allow any member of the MSU community to do all that same kind of stuff, to create a profile, to join groups, to host WordPress websites and, and all, of, all of that that the Commons affords. Um, and that we are we are hoping is going to lead to some significant expansion. First of all, we've got to we've got to serve more communities than just the humanities, right? So we're going to be opening disciplinary hubs that will reach out to the social sciences and to the STEM fields and think about how those disciplinary and interdisciplinary conversations might evolve. Um, and then from that point, we're starting to think about other campuses. Who wants to come in and, and be part of this larger network where a scholar can show up, have a single profile that they're maintaining, and um, connect it with their institutional life, their scholarly society life, and their public scholarship life all from one place? 
And you've talked about that pretty pretty openly about, you know, trying to reclaim some of the work that academia.edu or some of the other sites that actually are kind of doing this. And it goes to that principle at the heart of Mesh of, you know, trying to bring some of that back to the academy and own some of that data, but also kind of build it. I mean, I imagine the Hum Commons is built on top of a uh, Commons in a Box, yes. which is a City University of New York project with Matt Gold, yep. Boone Gorgeous, and many other people who will be talking at this event as well. So it's interesting that there is a pretty solid community that's trying to bring some of this stuff and kind of, you know, own the means of production, so to speak, when it comes exactly. to digital infrastructure. <laughs> exactly. Own the means of production and ensure that we're working in an environment in which, you know, we've got what a kind of data sovereignty, you know, in which the the people who are contributing the work to these networks can feel confident in their ownership of the work and in the ways that work is being used, that if it's being, um, you know, used by other people, it's in accordance with the ways that the scholars would want it to be used. So that kind of kind of control, also personal data privacy. I mean, that we are not mining any of of the information that's being shared with us for you know any kind of nefarious or non-nefarious purpose. Um, so yeah, I think um, there there is a real community out there um, from you know WordPress, BuddyPress, CBox to the Commons that's really interested in thinking about how we can create open source trusted spaces in which the academy can do this kind of work and maintain ownership and control over it. What are some of the infrastructural kind of options you're providing your community? Because I'm obviously, you know, speaking as, you know, Jim Groom from Reclaim Hosting, who's running Domains 21. One of the things obviously you all have been doing for this is you've been running your own instance of Domain of One's Own, um, the MSU Domains. And you've been exploring with, um, you know, what we might call the MSU cloud or at least Reclaim Cloud's MSU's instance of exploring that. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping you all could share a little bit about, you know, not only how are you using Domain of One's Own, but why Domain of One's Own and then why this separate thing for the cloud and what do each provide or maybe not, if that makes sense. Well, so Domain, so we've now been, had domains at MSU for I think over five years. Um, And... you know, for us, it was really a, we were doing similar work to what Domains has provided us on campus. Um, but, you know, very similar to some of the stories that, you know, anyone who's talked with Jim for a little while has heard about the origin story of Reclaim Hosting. It was similar in our case of we were running these systems that were taking up a ton of effort and time among our group. And, you um, but providing somewhat similar features to um, domains. And so when we got connected to domains, we realized that what it did was allowed us to take ourselves out of providing that core piece of infrastructure and running the servers and things, and instead to start to focus on ways that we're using it. So um, so the domains project for us has really been around um, digital presence in public scholarship. So getting faculty on our campus and graduate students on our campus to think about writing in public. Um, We have uh, regular uh, groups going, uh, we call them fellows programs. They run almost every semester. Uh, We have one starting um, in the next week on public writing and um, where we bring groups together and we talk about this and talk about using domains. And so that's sometimes a very simple use of domains in a WordPress site and a website, but Um, our larger experiments have started moving into connecting to places like AWS uh, S3 storage. So we might run projects, uh, an Omeka-based project that's then connected out to AWS storage for the artifacts um, or other spaces where we're connecting into Google Google Cloud Platform or other spaces. Um, So that kind of led us, um, kind of let us dip our feet into the cloud a bit. And so when opportunities came up to think about and work with Reclaim Cloud, um, that's something that Kathleen has um, really more been the one who's been working with it. So I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, I've been doing a, a bit of experimentation there and was super excited about the affordances that the cloud would provide. 
Um, precisely because of our interest. I mean, you know, as, as we talked about those, those core values that mesh research has in the ways that we work, we're building on open source infrastructure. We're trying to develop um, academy owned um, platforms that, that will enable academic organizations to act with greater data sovereignty. And so we, we sort of, I mean, if you'll forgive the phrase, we kind of want to eat our own dog food. Um, we had been relying on a whole series of tools um, like Slack, for instance, that are great and super, super functional, um, but that don't afford us the control over, um, over the work that we're doing in terms of the tools that we use um, as a team for project management or for communication or so forth. So one of the first things that I really wanted to experiment with and I had wanted to experiment with for some time was Mattermost, um, an, an open source alternative to Slack. And what um, the, the Reclaim Cloud allowed us to do was you know, the, the cloud version of a one-click installation um, for Mattermost to create our own instance in which we now have control over the teams that operate within that Mattermost instance, um, we have unlimited data. Um, and so we don't you know, have the, the problem with the free Slack where after 10,000 messages, everything disappears. We also don't have to worry about like what, what kinds of uses potentially or leakages um, of that data could happen in the background with a corporate provider of a software as a service because our Mattermost instance is ours. Um, so, you know, getting Mattermost set up and running um, on Reclaim Cloud was super easy. Um, customization took a little bit of effort. And, and as Jim, um, who was, you know, endless help to me um, in the process of getting um, things migrated over in the ways that I wanted them, um, can, can say together, Kathleen. We were learning, learning together and it was a delightful process. Um, but it, it, you know, it's, it was a little bit, it was a little bit of a challenge. Um, and I'm still, you know, facing some of those challenges. We have, you know, for instance, our, our, um, one of our project management platforms that we use, we use Trello. Um, and so I, you know, there is theoretically a connector between Trello and Mattermost that will let our Mattermost instance know when Trello cards have been updated and all of that sort of thing. Um, I have had some trouble getting that up and working. It's not up and working yet. So it's, you know, the cloud has been a learning experience. And, and one of the things that, you know, we most wanted to be able to do was to think about, like, what, what can the cloud do that domains can't? Um, one thing is host, um, you know, non-PHP based containerized platforms like Mattermost. Um, that that are are super powerful um, and and super useful to us. We've also had a little bit of an experiment with one of our colleagues who wasn't able to join us today, um, who teaches a course. Um, it's one of our Introduction to Digital Humanities courses, and um, she last semester taught that course using um, cloud-based installations of Mattermost, Jitsi, and Etherpad. Um, so introducing our DH students to open source tools um, for doing the kinds of work that she wanted them to do in class. The thing that's so great about having those hosted through Reclaim Cloud is that the semester ended, she wants to maintain those installations, but they don't need to run again until fall. So we just stopped them. Right. And, and they're still there. They can be started up again when we're ready. Um, but but we're not, you know, having to maintain the, the kinds of levels of charges that we would if they were running nonstop this entire time. Another cool thing I saw, I mean, and this is me peeking into the MSU mesh cloud is um, you got a discourse instance up and running, which, again, yeah. is something that we could not run very easily, if at all, in a shared environment like domain of one's own or a shared hosting, but like discourse is a great form software that only runs in Ruby and bam, like there's yeah. a great use case. 
It was it was great, and it was um, it was easier to get up and running than I expected it to be. And we've done you know been able to migrate you know so it's it is a mesh research instance of discourse. We're planning on hosting um, all of the the user support forums for all of our projects in that space. Right now, it's mostly just the humanities common stuff. We've migrated over all of our FAQs and a lot of our support documentation. Um, and it's it's really super powerful and flexible, and we're just delighted to have been able to get that started up. And one of the fun parts about um, Reclaim Cloud, and I'm not sure how much you've used it at all, um, is the ability to basically take any container, any Docker container, and spin up, if uh, assuming it works, right? Because they're mm -hmm. always, that. not all Docker containers are created equal, and spin that up so that you could have a very niche um, application for a faculty or for a researcher or for a student and just that one person needs it. But arguably um, with this setup, that's enough to, if it's been maintained and if it's a Docker instance, it would work. Um, so have you played at all with the Docker in Reclaim Cloud? I've not played with the Docker in Reclaim Cloud. However, I have some thoughts on how it really ties well to the work that we do in supporting the faculty in our work. Um, because similar to how Domain of One's Own has kind of taken away the uh, technical administrative piece of spinning up some of these things, um, it allows us to more quickly and easily, as you just said, Jim, um, spin up instances of things, um, discourse being a good example of that. Um, if our discourse instance goes on for a longer time and starts to gain um, a broader usage and that it's probably something that we would move off the cloud, off Reclaim Cloud into a different space um, for broad usage. And part of that is because keeping Reclaim Cloud as this space for uh, tinkering, for um, experimentation, for spinning up projects really quickly it gives us this kind of core piece of infrastructure that that we're paying for in the name of this experimentation and setting things up um, that we can then use if we move, you know, in the, in the case of this discourse instance, um, once we get this kind of set up and figured out, moving it to a, um, what I might term a more permanent space um, sitting in AWS or GCP or Google Cloud cl platform or something like that might be, um, long term, that's where our infrastructure, our major infrastructure goes and s then frees up space for another project to come in. So it's really important um, to us. And we do this with domains. Um, we do this with Reclaim Cloud now. We do it occasion. We do it with some other um, pieces of cloud infrastructure where we're able to support our projects that are more in development or more emerging projects that don't have funding to attach them or don't have other um, means of paying for the services and infrastructure that they need. We can provide them with really powerful spaces for this um, to get them into proof of concept mode, to get them started, um, right. to support some of these things, and then move them um, and free up that space for a next project to start up. And a real next generation sandbox, right? Because that's yeah. what, for us, LAMP environments that are fairly common now were back in 2004, 2005, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, you know, really connected to kind of what you have probably experienced at, at UMW when you were um, initially imagining what domains looked like. You know, our initial forays back, you know, when I was working with this with cPanel and other things like that back in that era of 2004, 2005 was literally um, to make it easier for me for when someone wanted to experiment with WordPress, for them to just spin it up quickly and easily and play with it. And if they didn't like it after a day or two, then we just took it down. We could just take it down and get rid of it with, with cPanel and with that infrastructure that Domains is built on. And, and cloud is really allowing us that similar sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, All too, yes. Yeah. Right? So, so one of the parts of the, um, some research that I do um, along with Kristen Mapes, who we wish could have been here, but um, exactly. wasn't here today. Um, we do some work around um, distant visualization of graphical media and films. And so using tools like that to bring um, 
media down to our computer so we can start to deconstruct them and work with it is important. But what was great is I use command line YouTube DL for my work because I can script it and I can do it a lot faster. But when we do it with a classroom and we're just trying to get some students to understand how this process works, being able to spin that up quickly, mm -hmm. show it to some students and then take it down the next day because it's not something we needed up and running is hugely powerful for that. Kathleen, you talk, talked about the start and stop. And yeah. the start and stop web was something for me that was very hard being a LAMP environment person for so long. I mean, we built UMW blogs on LAMP. Like that's, we started on Bluehost and then we moved it to, you know, cast iron coding and then we moved it to reclaim hosting. But like the idea is that those experiments always start small and then they have to be enterprised and figured out. But I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that you could pay cents for an application for an hour a week that you needed for a class, for a lab, and then turn it off. And yeah. in that regard, you wouldn't want to run WordPress or a lot of the PHP apps in Reclaim Cloud. You'd want to run them, the applications that you only need temporarily, or like the all tube where you need it, you demonstrate, or you're doing something, and then you turn it off. And it just changes the model of thinking about computing in some ways, right? Or at least web computing. It really does. And that's one of the things that I think Scott was sort of gesturing at about how we might take some of the experiments that we've done, like our discourse instance. And once we know we've got it stabilized, move it somewhere because it's likely going to have to run 24 seven in order to be able to deal with customer needs and, and user support and all of that kind of thing. Um, and so in fact, the cloud, you know, depending on how the cost model begins to, to break down, it might not be the most um, effective place for us to run it over the long haul. Um, but for things like where we're just getting started, we want to evaluate something, we want to figure out whether it's going to work, we want to experiment with connecting this to that and see what can be done. Um, the cloud is perfect for us to be able to spin something up fast and then, then really evaluate what it's going to do for us. And it's interesting, too, because one of the things when we started this, so this was a pandemic project, like in February, we had no idea of what the next level of, of Reclaim Cloud was going to be. And by April, Tim had found the software that allowed us to basically get this up and running over the summer. And you yeah. were some of the first experimenters with that. But what it really struck us as is as we've been trying to provide people support on PHP apps like Omega and WordPress, and some of the things that kind of made us what we are, mm -hmm. we figured the same thing is going to be very prevalent for digital humanists and beyond with these next generation scholarship tools where they're going to not only need the environments, because there is AWS, there is Google Cloud, there is DigitalOcean, and we can't pretend ever to compete with any of them, nor would we try. But there is also that piece of do you have someone you can talk to or a community you can reach out to to get some of these things running? And I think that for us was where Reclaim Cloud would make sense. Not that it's a long-term solution because things will go to AWS and that's the way of the, the web. Yeah. But like, do we have places for faculty, students, researchers, et cetera, to actually even play with the cloud or even imagine what it is and what it could do, right? Yeah. Absolutely. That's a, I think that's a really good point too, Jim, because I see our Reclaim Cloud instance as this kind of middle ground in the space that we work. And so, you know, for a, for a big, um, very intentionally grown mesh project, um, we might we might not need Reclaim Cloud for it because we we have you know our associate director for technology and mesh you know, has the expertise and the knowledge to do some of the higher level things, spinning up the spaces in the broader cloud platform providers. But I think it's those spaces around that we've been talking about around the experimentation around the startup where, you know, to, to me, it's not worth um, expending a ton of technical expertise and time to spin up something very large when we're unsure how something's going to work for a certain situation. And that's where um, Reclaim Cloud is helpful for us in that. And I think could be helpful in, in spaces too, where, you know, if Kathleen and Kristen and I could administrate and run Reclaim Cloud without Brian, our technical director, 
Um, but we could not do that in something like DigitalOcean without Brian's expertise in setting things up. So, you know, for smaller teams in that too, it's really a, a great space to be able to do these things that, you know, as you said, it, give the opportunity to imagine what the what the cloud-based web looks like. Well, this has been amazing. I want to thank both of you for taking your time um, to join us for Domains 21 and talking about your work, not only broadly with Mesh, which I really find inspiring, particularly your kind of mission and what you're doing and aligning the idea of infrastructure with the idea of equity, I think is a super important um, kind of mission going forward for many of us, but also just your specific work in Domains and support of us over the years. We really appreciate all your great stuff. And we're really grateful for it um, and for the opportunity to do all of this kind of experimentation. So thanks cool. a lot. Well, thank you both. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you on the flip side. <laughs> nom, nom, nom.